Chapter 9 looks at muscle tissue. Remember that muscle tissue is one of the four primary tissues that we looked at earlier in the semester. It is divided into three types of muscle. Skeletal muscle, which is responsible for moving the skeleton, moving the bones. Cardiac muscle, which rhythmically contracts the heart. And smooth muscle, which forms layers around other tissues. Some key vocabulary points. When you see myo in a word, this refers to muscle. When you see sarco in a word, this refers to flesh. The functions of skeletal muscles. We're going to spend most of our time on the skeletal muscle tissue and skeletal muscles, and then look very briefly at both cardiac and smooth muscles. Functions of skeletal muscles. They are responsible for producing skeletal movement. When muscles contract, they pull on tendons. And remember that tendons are attached to bones. So when muscles contract, they pull the tendons, which then pull the bones. They help to maintain body position. We think about the muscles of posture and the muscles that are responsible for holding our head up. They support soft tissues. Your muscles of the abdominal wall and the floor of your pelvic cavity help to support your major abdominal organs. They guard openings. The openings of the digestive and urinary tract have a ring of skeletal muscle that gives voluntary control to these functions. They help to maintain body temperature. Muscles need energy to contract, and heat is a byproduct of this contraction. Think about it. When we are cold, we shiver, and that is our skeletal muscles contracting to produce heat. And lastly, they are a nutrient reserve. Muscles will be broken down as a protein source when our diet is deficient. Now, we're first we're going to look at the structure of a skeletal muscle. A skeletal muscle, for example, your bicep muscle, is an organ. It is made up of muscle tissue, connective tissue, nerves, and blood vessels. Now, one point of vocabulary to, to become familiar with, when we look at or refer to a single muscle cell, we don't call it a cell, we call it a fiber. We mentioned this back in the tissue chapter. Every single muscle cell will run the entire length of that muscle. So they can be very, very long. As a result, we call them fibers instead of cells. Muscles, again, as I think your bicep muscle, has three layers of connective tissue that uh, subdivide that muscle into different components. The first layer of connective tissue is called the epimyceum. This is the exterior layer of collagen fibers that surround the entire muscle body. So this, again, where the bicep muscle, the epimyceum would be covering the whole outside of the bicep. This is connected, the epimyceum is connected to the deep fascia, and it helps to separate muscles from the surrounding tissues. Now, when you cut through a muscle, notice that it is made up of smaller bundles. These bundles are called fasciae. And the second connective tissue layer is called the perimyceum. The perimyceum is what surrounds each of these individual fasciae. Within the perimyceum, you will find blood vessels and nerves to supply each of these fasciae. But notice that a fasciae is also divided into smaller bundles. Each of these bundles is known as a muscle fiber or an individual muscle cell. They are surrounded by what is called an endomyceum, which is our third layer of connective tissue. The endomyceum surrounds the individual muscle cells or muscle fibers. Here you will find fine capillary nerve fibers, and myosatellite cells, which are stem cells that we'll talk about in a moment. They are all found here. So again, think of it as multiple layers. If we start from the smallest, we're going to start with an individual cell, the muscle fiber, that is surrounded by the endomyceum. We put many of these 
muscle fibers together and we create a bundle called a fasciolae. This fasciolae is surrounded by a connective tissue layer called the perimyceum. And then we put several of these fasciolae together to create a whole muscle. And that muscle is surrounded by the epimyceum. Now, the endomyceum, perimyceum, and epimyceum all come together at the ends of a muscle and form the connective tissue attachment to the bone matrix. So, in other words, they become the tendon that will attach itself to the muscle. A tendon is when these fibers form a bundle and will go from muscle to bone. But they can also form an aponeurosis. An aponeurosis is a sheet and they will connect muscle to muscle. But both of these, a tendon or an aponeurosis, represent these three sets of connective tissue that all come together uh, at the end of our muscle. Now we're going to look at one individual muscle fiber and look at how they are made and uh, what the, the cells look like. Muscle fibers develop through the fusion of myoblast. Again, myo means muscle, blast means a builder. So these are cells that build muscles. This is how muscle fibers can become so large. So hundreds and thousands of these myoblasts fuse, come together and fuse to create a fiber that can become very large. Each myoblast will contribute one nucleus to that final fiber. So this is why uh, the skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated because each nucleus represents one myoblast that went into the creation of this fiber. Any myoblasts that do not fuse will become myosatellite cells. These cells play a role after injury to re help to repair the muscle. Now let's look at parts of the fiber. Yes, they are a cell just like any other cell in the body, but they look different because they are long and cylindrical. So they have a slightly different uh, vocabulary to represent the structures uh, uh, associated with the cell. First, the sarcoplasma. This term refers to the cytoplasm of a muscle fiber. The sarcolemma refers to the cell membrane of the fiber. Here, we'll talk about uh, in just a, a little bit, a sudden change in the transmembrane potential across the sarcolemma is the first step in a contraction. It leads to or it creates what is known as an action potential. And this is how our muscles ultimately shorten and contract. Now, looking inside, Okay, we see these yellow structures. These are known as transverse tubules or T-tubules for short. They are extensions of the sarcolemma that extend into the sarcoplasm. So you see these holes on the surface of the cell. That is where the transverse tubule comes down. They help to transmit the action potential into and through our muscle fiber. So they allow the entire fiber to react and to contract simultaneously. Now, before we go too much further, I want to look at the organization of this fiber. So again, when we talk about a muscle fiber, we're talking about the whole cell. It would be a muscle cell. But look at how it, too, is arranged in bundles. Inside of our cell, we see these bundles. This is one of them pulled out. This is called a myofibril. Notice, too, that these myofibrils, when we look over here, also have even smaller bundles inside. These are known as myofilaments. So keep your vocabulary straight. Keep the organization straight. This will make it so much easier as you go through. Muscle fiber, the whole cell. It is broken up into smaller bundles called myofibrils. 
and then the myofibrils are also broken up into myofilaments and there will be thin filaments and thick filaments okay now we're going to look at the rest of the organization of the cell look at these blue structures inside this is known as the sarcoplasmic reticulum this is similar to and equivalent to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum that we see in other cells. They are the a sarcoplasmic reticulum is a membranous structure that surrounds each individual myofibril, okay? each one of these smaller subunits of our muscle fiber. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is important for the storage of calcium. So calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Inside we see a structure called a triad. Tri means three, so there are three structures that come together. A triad represents a pair of terminal cisternae. What these are, uh, if you can kind of see it in this picture, the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are kind of bulging. They're a little bit bigger than the rest of the area. These are called terminal cisternae, the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And there is a T-tubule running through the middle. So a triad, two terminal cisternae with a T-tubule in the middle. These three structures will communicate with each other via diffusion. Now let's go even smaller. We're going to look at these myofibrils. Myofibrils are discrete bundles of myofilaments. And again, remember the myofibrils run also the entire length of that cell. Myofibrils are made up of myofilaments. And it's the myofilaments that are responsible for the muscle contraction. And these filaments come in two forms. We have a thin filament, which is also known as actin, and is made up of the protein actin, and thick filaments that are made up of the protein myosin. So let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. Down here is one individual myosin molecule. But the myosin in the uh, filament, called myofilament of myosin, are hundreds of these individual molecules all twisted together. Each individual myosin molecule has a long tail. This is how one myosin binds to another one. And it has this globular head region. You can see all the little heads sticking up here. The head reaches toward the nearest actin filament. During a contraction, the myosin heads will interact with an actin filament and they form what are called cross bridges and you will link myosin to actin. The myosin heads end up pivoting producing motion whenever ATP is present. So you can see that here at rest the head is kind of bent backwards but when it's activated and a muscle contracts it pivots because it is attached to the actin, it pulls that actin along with it. Let's look at the actin filament. We're going to start with the second portion here, the G actin. This is a full actin molecule down here. See all these orange little beady structures? These are known as G actin. They are globular protein molecules. I envision them, if you've ever played with poppet beads, and you kind of hook and you stick these beads together. When you link many of these G-actins together, you create F-actin. F-actin is a strand of two of these twisted rows of G-actin. So this whole, when you put two of these together, this whole structure is the F-actin. Each individual orange circle here is a G-actin. Now, you're looking at these structures. This is showing how the actin and the myosin are put together. The blue represents the my myosin. The red lines represent the actin. And notice it creates these lines and banding patterns. This structure that we have highlighted here is called a sarcomere. 
A sarcomere represents the functional unit of a contraction. And this is what creates the banding pattern or the striations in a skeletal muscle. These are, a sarcomere repeats itself all the way down that muscle fiber, creating these striations and these banding patterns. So let's look at the lines and the bands that make up a sarcomere. First, we have the Z line. We see one here and here. We see a blow up of it here. The Z lines are at the end of a sarcomere. So another way to define a sarcomere is a sarcomere runs from Z line to Z line. As we see here, Z line to the next Z line. That is one sarcomere. Then there would be another sarcomere here and so on. The Z line is made up of another protein called actinin. And what this protein does is help to anchor the thin filaments in the sarcomere. We have the M line. This runs right down the middle of the sarcomere. This helps to stabilize the myosin filaments. You can see how they're all attached here to this M line. We have what's called an A band from here to here. You see it down here, we go from here to here. The A band is also called the dark band and it represents the entire length of myosin. So the A band is as long as these dark blue myosin uh, filaments. H band, okay, it's right here in the center. The H band contains only myosin. And over here, we have the red only, we have the I band. This is only actin. And these are referred to as the thick and the thin areas. The H band is called the thick band because it is only made up of thick filaments. The I band is called the thin band because it only has actin, which are the thin filaments. This other area here is called the zone of overlap. This is where the actin and the myosin overlap with each other. Now, there are other uh, structural proteins that can be found within the sarcomere. One is titin. This runs from the tip of the myosin filaments to the Z line. This is this spiral green protein here. It helps to stabilize and attach the thick filament to the Z line. Down here in our actin molecule, we have this thin kind of light purple line thread running through. This is called nebulin. Nebulin helps to hold the F-actin strands together to stabilize the actin. These green twisted threads, this is called tropomyosin. These cover the active sites on actin when the muscle is at rest and it prevents the interaction between the actin and the myosin. Then we have these little buttons here that are on the uh, tropomyosin. This is another protein called troponin. Troponin is what helps to position the tropomyosin on the actin. So it binds to the, the tropomyosin to the G actin. The position of the troponin is controlled by calcium. When calcium binds to the troponin, it causes a conformational shift and it will move the tropomyosin to free up the active site so that the myosin heads can interact with it. So it's important to know where a zone or a band is and what proteins are found in each of these bands as well. So make sure you familiarize yourself. Now we said a sarcomere is a functional unit of contraction. So what happens is we create what is called the sliding filament theory. The top picture represents a sarcomere when the muscle is at rest. The bottom, this is what happens to a sarcomere when the muscle is contracted. And this process is known as a sliding filament theory. What happens is that actin will slide toward the M line. It slides over the myosin. Look at the difference in these two pictures. 
Myosin doesn't go anywhere. That A band never changes. But the actin got pulled inward closer to that M line. So looking at the difference, as a muscle contracts and that sarcomere shortens, the zone of overlap enlarges. The H band and the I band get smaller. The A band is unchanged. Like I said, that myosin never goes anywhere, never changes. The M line is unchanged. It remains in the center of that sarcomere. And the Z lines move closer together. So as a result, the sarcomere shortens. And as many sarcomere shorten, the muscle gets shorter and contracts. Now let's look at this process in more detail as far as what is actually happening between the actin and the myosin. So this, is, this picture here represents how the sliding filament works. We're going to start with the upper picture. Again, this represents when a muscle is at rest. This is a resting sarcomere. At rest, the myosin head points away from the end line. So you see how it's bent backwards? That means the M line is someplace to the left in this picture. Looking at our actin, the tropomyosin is covering the active site on that actin. Notice, too, that our myosin head has stored energy in it. This is from an earlier split of ATP. So in our myosin head, you see ADP plus phosphate bound to that head. Now, move to the right picture. Notice what we see present now, calcium. Calcium ions have bound to the troponin. And remember, when calcium binds to troponin, it results in the tropomyosin shifting. This is going to free the active sites on the actin. And remember, that myosin head was energized. It has stored energy in it. As soon as that active site has been exposed, that supercharged myosin head is going to pop up and it's going to latch on to it. This is a cross bridge. It is a link between myosin and actin. We have bridged the gap here between the actin and the myosin. Coming down. The stored energy in that myosin head is going to be released, and this is going to result in a shape change. Look at that myosin head here versus here. The head has pivoted or moved toward the M line. This is known as a power stroke. And because that head is attached to the actin, it is pulling the actin with it. Next picture here, a new ATP is going to bind to that myosin head. When this happens, it breaks the link between the myosin and the active site so that this active site is now free to form another cross bridge. And then lastly, that free myosin will split that ATP into ADP and phosphate. We have re charged that myosin. That head recocks, resets, in other words it pulls back again, and the cycle is ready to repeat itself. That head can latch on again. It will repeat this circle over and over and over as long as calcium is present. All right, so how do we control contractions? All right, we have to understand a few terms first. The term motor unit. A motor unit is one motor nerve fiber and all of the individual muscle fibers it makes contact with. The process of contraction begins when the sarcolemma is stimulated. So what this means is we have two uh, nerve fibers, a blue one and a green one. This blue one is coming down and will stimulate two muscle fibers in this muscle. The green one stimulates three of them. So when an action potential is generated in the blue nerve, it will stimulate these two fibers to contract. If it's coming down the green one, 
it stimulates those three to contract. Now, how does this happen? This action potential transfer occurs at what is called a neuromuscular junction, the junction between a neuron and a muscle fiber. Look at this picture. The blue up here represents the motor neuron. The yellowish area represents the muscle fiber. But notice that the two do not touch each other. They do not make contact. Okay? This is known as a synapse, an almost junction between the neuron and the muscle. There is a gap between. This is known as a cleft or the synaptic cleft. The nerve does not touch the muscle fiber. All right, so what happens? An action potential will be generated in our motor nerve. This is an electrical signal. It will come down that motor neuron to this end point. This is called a synaptic terminal, the end of our nerve. So it's each branch of a motor nerve ends at a synaptic terminal with a muscle fiber. Now, like we said, they don't touch. There's a cleft, a gap between. So that electrical impulse, that electrical signal has to be get from our motor nerve to our muscle fiber. It has to cross that cleft and be transferred to the mo muscle fiber. This is known as the motor end plate. How does it do this? Notice that in our and the synaptic terminal here, there are these little vesicles with these red dots inside. That is a material called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. This is how the electrical signal will cross that cleft. So when an action potential comes down to the synaptic terminal and stimulates that motor nerve, it releases this acetylcholine into this synaptic cleft. That neurotransmitter, that chemical, crosses the cleft and will bind to receptors. We see it over here on the sarcolemma of this motor end plate of our muscle fiber. When acetylcholine binds, it causes sodium to rush into the sarcoplasma. This results in an action potential now being generated in our muscle fiber. Now, notice that there are also these little yellow half moon structures. Okay. As soon as that acetylcholine is released, it almost immediately begins to be broken down by an enzyme. This enzyme is called acetylcholine esterase. What it does is it helps to reset that neuromuscular junction for another signal. And it also prevents overstimulation of our muscle. So it will break them down and also helps restore or repack that acetylcholine back in the motor nerve so this can happen again. All right, so how does this transfer of an action potential to our muscle fiber actually result in a contraction? This is known as excitation contraction coupling. We're going to turn an electrical signal into a contraction. So again, to recap, that action potential has come down our motor nerve into the synaptic terminal. When it arrives at the synaptic terminal, it causes the release of acetylcholine, the little red circles, that bind to receptors on the sarcolemma. This generates an action potential here. This action potential on the sarcolemma will travel until it hits a T-tubule. And then it dives down this T-tubule deep into the muscle fiber until it reaches a triad. Okay. Uh, to be complete, we should have another terminal cisternae on this side to make a triad. That action potential will stimulate or be transferred to that sarcoplasmic reticulum, causing it to dump all of its calcium into the sarcoplasma.
And now this is just one of the pictures we looked at before. Calcium, once it's released, calcium will bind to the troponin and cause a shift, a change in that complex, exposing the active site. And our charged myosin head pops up and latches on. So this connects now a nerve impulse action potential to the actual contraction in our sarco, uh, our, our, um, uh, within our muscle fiber that we just talked about before. Now a contraction represents fiber shortening. As the sarcomere shorten, the muscle pulls together producing tension. Tension in individual fibers can vary and we'll talk more about this later. Now how long a contraction lasts depends on a number of things. First, it depends on the duration of the neural stimulus. One single stimulus or one single action potential coming down only has a brief effect. Remember that enzyme within that uh, synapse. The contraction will only continue if additional action potentials ar arrive at that synaptic terminal in rapid succession. But if it's only one quick impulse, it's going to be one quick contraction and it's done. But if there's many of these coming through, the contraction will last longer. Secondly, it depends on the number of free calcium ions in the sarcoplasm. As soon as that calcium has been released, the sarcoplasmic reticulum begins to actively pump it back in again. So, you again, you're going to need multiple action potentials in succession in order to maintain a level of contraction. And finally, the availability of ATP. ATP is needed to recharge the myosin head. It is also needed to pump that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So a muscle needs ATP to contract, but it also needs it to be able to relax as well. All right, so let's look at this relaxation process. For a muscle to relax, calcium needs to be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, out of the, the sarcoplasm. And remember, this is an active transport and it requires ATP to do it. As the calcium is pumped back, it will detach itself from the troponin. When there's no more calcium on the troponin, the tropomyosin will recover those active sites and there's no place left for the myosin to bind. Sarcomeres, however, will remain contracted. They shorten actively, but there's no active mechanism for reversing this process. There are other external forces that act on a contracted fiber to stretch them back to their original dimensions. Now, let's look at a couple of things related to these processes. First is rigor mortis. Rigor mortis is a fixed muscular contraction that occurs after death. It is caused by a lack of ATP. The ion pumps now cease to function. The, after death, the cells cannot produce or make any more ATP. So, that calcium is going to build up in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It can't be pumped back, or sarcoplasm, sorry, it cannot be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Also, with no uh, ATP, the myosin heads cannot be reset. So the muscle stays in the state of rigor or constant contraction. Tension. This is an all or none principle that we refer to what happens in our muscle fiber. As a whole, a muscle fiber is either contracted or relaxed. There are no partial contractions. This all or none principle, though, only refers to a single fiber. It does not refer to the muscle as a whole. The tension of a single muscle fiber depends on several things. One, it depends on the number of cross bridges and overlap of the actin and myosin. It depends on the resting, fiber resting length at the time of stimulation. 
Tension is greatest when the zone of overlap is large. This will determine the degree of overlap between the actin and the myosin. Tension also depends on the frequency of stimulation. This is known as something as summation. This will affect the internal concentration of calcium and, as a result, the amount of calcium bound to the troponin. So let's look at this. For this idea of frequency of stimulation. A single neurostimulation will produce one single contraction, which is known as a twitch. A twitch will last between 7 and 100 milliseconds, depends on the muscle fiber. Sustained muscular contractions require repeated stimuli. So first, let's look at a twitch. A twitch is a response of the muscle to a single signal, and it is broken down into three phases, the latent period, contraction phase, and relaxation phase. So here in our graph, the green arrow represents where the stimulus was applied. The latent period is the time between when the stimulus was applied and when the muscle begins to shorten. On our graph, it looks like a flat line. It looks like nothing is happening in our muscle, but a lot is going on. This is the time the action potential has arrived at that neuromuscular junction. It has crossed that synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine is bound to the receptors, getting an action potential in our muscle fiber, travels along the sarcolemma to the T-tubule, et cetera, et cetera, up to the point of that calcium being released. That is the latent period. And it, like I said, it looks like nothing is happening because it's a flat line, but an awful lot is going on in our muscle. We just can't measure it. Then we have the contraction phase. This is after the calcium ions have bound, and they free up the active site, the myosin heads are latching on, forming these cross bridges, and tension will build to a peak. Then we have the relaxation phase. Calcium levels fall off, the active sites are covered again, and tension goes back to a resting level. Notice it takes a muscle longer to relax than it does for it to contract. This is because it requires ATP to relax. We are relying on an active transport pump to move that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now the twitch duration varies between muscle. It depends on the type of muscle, its location, and other environmental influences. Our eye muscles twitch very quickly. Gastrocnemus and soleus, these are the two muscles that make up our calf. Gastrocnemus, this is the main muscle in our calf, is a faster twitcher compared to the soleus. This has a much longer twitch duration time. Now let's look at the idea of frequency of stimulation. If a muscle fiber is stimulated again before the relaxation phase is complete, a second, more powerful contraction will result. So again, here's our first stimulus and the muscle contracted. It was starting to relax but it didn't get all the way down and it was stimulated again. And we get a stronger contraction. It tries to relax, it's stimulated again, stronger. We, uh, so you, what we're doing is we are increasing the tension by summing up these twitches. We have not changed the intensity of that stimulus. So example, this may be five volts, okay, gives a little twitch. But if we don't let that muscle completely relax and hit it with another 5 volts, it'll look like we actually hit it with 10 volts. But we haven't. We've just increased the frequency. We did not give that muscle a chance to relax. If we increase the frequency enough, we can put our muscle into tetanus. If rapid stimulation continues, twitches will reach a maximum level of tension and tetanus occurs when the muscle never has a chance to relax. 
you will see this continuous fused contraction with no relaxation phase at all. Now what about tetanus, the disease? This is caused by the bacteria Clostridium tetani. Tetanus has between a 40 and 78 percent mortality rate. This is why we have a vaccine. We're all vaccinated against this. It is found typically in the soil and it multiplies rapidly in contaminated wounds. Now the bacteria is not the problem. What causes the disease tetanus is the toxin that the bacteria produce. This toxin blocks the release of inhibitory neurotransmitter of our muscle fibers or our motor fibers. It is one of the three most potent toxins known, botulin and uh, diphtheria being the other two. So basically what this toxin does is it results in unchecked release of acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junctions. So the muscle is constantly being stimulated and doesn't have a chance to relax. How can we increase the contractile force? Tension produced by a whole skeletal muscle can be increased in two ways. What we've looked at has been tension in a single fiber. But, you know, muscles, you know, if we're going to do a bicep curl, we're going to use more than a single fiber. So how can we increase the tension in our whole muscle? We can do it by summation, getting the maximum force from each individual fiber in that muscle. And we can also do it via recruitment. This is activating more motor units. All right, so let's look at recruitment. The smooth motion in a group of muscles is produced by slowly increasing the size or the number of motor units stimulated. Each motor unit has its own threshold or its own uh, how much of a stimulus it needs to fire. So again, go back to a bicep curl. If you have no weight in your hand and you flex your elbow, you are not using every single motor unit, every single fiber in that muscle to do that work. But if you put a five pound weight in your hand, you are now going to reach the stimulus or the threshold of some other motor units and they will be stimulated to fire to help you lift that five pound weight. Maximum tension occurs when all motor units reach tetanus. So in other words, think about a weight that you cannot lift. And you try to lift it, that is maximum tension. You have reached and recruited all motor units. You may or may not be able to lift that weight, but you are using all your motor units trying to do this. Maximum tension can only be sustained for a very short period of time. Our biggest motor units are not even under our conscious control. The force generated by these could actually tear our muscles and break the bones if we were to reach maximum tension. They can, however, be activated through the fight or flight response. You know, think about the, uh, these times when you've heard about people being able to lift a, an automobile off of somebody who's been trapped in these times of uh, this fight or flight response in the body. Now, what about muscle tone? In any skeletal muscle, some motor units are always going to be active. This produces tension within the muscle, which is known as tone. Tone is particularly important for muscles of posture and those responsible for stabilizing our joints. They vary tone here in these muscles of posture. They will vary the specific motor unit that is active at any given time. So look at this picture. All right, so we have three motor units in this muscle. We have the orange motor unit, the blue motor unit, and the purple motor unit. Imagine this is a muscle that helps to hold our head up, okay? maintain tone, hold our head up. As long as we are awake, that muscle has to be working. Why doesn't it get tired? Why doesn't it fatigue? Because it spreads out the work. So for the first, say, I don't know, 
first period of time, it is going to be the orange motor unit that is firing and holding your head up. It will get a chance to rest as the blue motor unit fires. When it starts to rest, the purple one fires. And by that time now, the orange one is ready to fire. And it cycles like this all during the entire time that you are active and awake. So it varies the specific motor unit, which is active. Now remember, if a muscle is active and a muscle is contracting, it is using ATP. And that means to get ATP, we have to use glucose. So calories are burned. Muscle tone is a major source of calories burned in most weight loss programs. The more, for example, your core muscles, the more tone you have in your core, the more calories you are going to be burning even when you are not exercising. All right, so what are some energy sources? Muscle contraction requires a lot of ATP. There are 15 billion myosin heads per muscle fiber each of which uses 2,500 molecules of ATP every single second. Our cells only store enough ATP to start a contraction. Muscle fibers must manufacture more ATP as needed. And there are three main sources of ATP. First is creatine phosphate. This is for short term. Creatine phosphate is the storage molecule for excess ATP energy in a resting muscle. Creatine phosphate will only last for about 15 seconds. So the stored energy will be used to recharge ADP and create ATP. It uses the enzyme creatine phosphokinase to do this, CK or, uh, CK or CPK. So if a cell has some excess energy, it will store that energy in the form of creatine phosphate. But then we can, when we need ATP, we can take that phosphate back, add it to ADP with this enzyme, and create ATP. But we only store enough creatine phosphate to help our muscles work for about 15 seconds. There is anaerobic glycolysis. This source will last for about 130 seconds, just over two minutes. This process occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. This is the main energy source for peak muscular activity. What it does is it will break down glucose from glycogen that is stored in our skeletal muscles. However, it only is able to produce two ATP molecules per molecule of glucose. So again, it's not a major source of ATP. Then we have aerobic metabolism. This will last for roughly 40 minutes. This process occurs in the mitochondria of the cell and typically would use fatty acids. This is the main energy source uh, and supply of ATP in our resting muscles. It will break down fatty acids and it can also break down glucose. When it breaks down glucose, you will get 34 ATPs per glucose. Now, the good thing is our muscle cells can switch from one process to another to generate ATP. But our muscles will still and can still fatigue. At peak exertion, muscles will lack the oxygen needed to support the mitochondria and aerobic respiration. Muscles then need to rely on anaerobic glycolysis to produce ATP. The problem with this is that the pyruvic acid, a breakdown product, will build up and this will be converted into lactic acid. When muscles can no longer perform a required activity, they are said to be fatigued. You will see depletion of the metabolic reserves, glycogen stores, and ATP. This can also, severe fatigue can cause damage to the sarcolemma and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is due mainly to the low pH that is generated from the lactic acid that builds up. 
Muscles have another means of metabolism called the Cori cycle. The Cori cycle is designed to remove and recycle the lactic acid by shunting it off to the liver. The liver will take this lactic acid and convert it back into pyruvic acid that can then be used to recharge glucose. Glucose will then be released to go back to the muscle to recharge the glycogen reserves. Several hormones have an effect on our muscles. Growth hormone will affect the synthesis of actin and myosin, as does testosterone. Thyroid hormone elevates muscle ATP consumption, so it uh, revs up metabolism in the use of ATP. Epinephrine mobilizes glycogen reserves and breakdown uh, so that your muscles can work faster and stronger. Now, not all muscle fibers are of the same type. Some fibers are described as being fast fibers or anaerobic fibers because they rely on the anaerobic generation of ATP. Most skeletal muscles in the body can reach peak tension in about 0.01 seconds after being stimulated. When we look at a large fiber or a fast fiber, they have a very large diameter with many myofibrils inside. They also have large glycogen reserves. This is a quick source of, of glucose. They produce strong contractions with uh, you know, their tension strength is related to the number of myofibrils. So the more myofibrils you have, the more tension you can generate and the stronger the contraction will be. As a result, they produce powerful, strong contractions. On the downside, they have very few mitochondria and a small blood supply. So yes, they use ATP, but they, and they, they're making it anaerobically because they don't have the blood to supply the oxygen and they don't have the mitochondria to support aerobic production of ATP. So they use huge quantities of ATP, but can't regenerate it. As a result, they contract and fatigue quickly. So if you are a weightlifter or a bodybuilder, you think about when you lift these huge amounts of weight, you can only hold them up for a very short period of time and then you drop them down. Brief, short, yet powerful contractions. Now contrast that with slow fibers. These are aerobic fibers. or They generate ATP through aerobic metabolism. They have, each individual fiber is half the diameter of a fast fiber, and they take three times as long to reach peak tension. So they have fewer myofibrils. This makes them a, a smaller diameter, and as a result, produce weaker contractions. On the upside, they have many mitochondria and a very good blood supply. This higher blood supply will bring in more oxygen to support and supply the mitochondria. They also contain myoglobin. Myoglobin is similar to hemoglobin, and it can bind and store oxygen in that fiber. As a result, this type of fiber contracts slowly, but it also fatigues slowly. Distance runners, marathon runners would rely on slow fibers to sustain them for the long period of time that they are running. Most fibers in the body are somewhere in between. They are intermediate fibers. They have very little myoglobin like the fast fibers, and they, but they have a better blood supply and more mitochondria compared to the fast fibers. Now this is a picture showing here, this would be your slow fibers, small diameter, lots of myoglobin, so it makes them darker in color. And these would be your fast fibers, thicker fibers, larger diameter fibers, paler in color because they don't have the blood supply and they don't have the, the myoglobin. Muscles grow. This is known as hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is an increase in cell size. When a muscle hypertrophies, 
you will see an increase in diameter of the muscle fibers. What happens is they fill themselves with more myofibrils. They also increase the number of mitochondria, mitochondria, glycogen reserves, and glycolytic enzymes. Overall, the number of muscle fibers, i.e. muscle cells themselves, do not change. But the muscle as a whole enlarges because each one of those individual cells will increase in diameter. Atrophy is a decrease in cell size. It's a reverse of this process. This could be due to either to the lack of use, it might be due to nerve damage, or hormonal imbalances. And you will see a decrease in size, tone, and strength. Now this is a dynamic process. Basically what you don't use, you are going to lose. Muscle tone indicates the base activity in motor units of a skeletal muscle. Muscles will become flaccid when they are inactive for a few days or weeks. Muscle fibers will then begin to break down protein forming urea. And when this happens, they can become smaller and weaker. With prolonged inactivity, Fibrous tissue and adipose, adipose tissue may actually replace the muscle fibers. Now, if you are trying to train for one type of sport or another, you want to build up your endurance. So let's look at anaerobic endurance first. If you are trying to build up anaerobic endurance, think our weightlifters, you know, uh, strong but brief muscle contractions, you are going to want to increase the amount of ATP, creatine ph uh, phosphate, and glycogen stores in the muscle. The more of these you have will increase the length of time the muscle can contract and continue to be supported. Fatigue usually begins about two minutes after the start of an activity. So again, think about weightlifting and something else that would be anaerobic endurance would be somebody training for, say, a 50 meter dash or a 100 meter dash. Quick, short bursts. Endurance can be increased through hypertrophy. This is why weightlifters have much more muscle bulk compared to marathon runners. It's a different type of uh, way that you build up your muscles. Aerobic endurance, you want to increase your number of slow fibers and increase your cardiovascular performance. You will see an increased performance due to an increased nutrient supply. Endurance athletes tend to bulk up on carbohydrates roughly three days before an event. And then training involves sustained low levels of muscular activities. Very briefly, we're going to look at the last two types of muscles. Cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle tissue is made up of cardiocytes. These cells are small compared to our skeletal muscle cells. They have a single nucleus. They have short, wide T-tubules, but no triads. They do have a sarcoplasmic reticulum, but it doesn't have the terminal cisternae. They are aerobic. They, have, they are very high in myoglobin and a large number of mitochondria. They also possess intercalated discs. These are a combination of gap junctions and desmosomes. Gap junctions will allow communication between the cells, allowing the action potentials to move very quickly over the heart. The desmosomes help to stabilize the position of the cells. Contraction of our cardiocytes is a little bit different. Due to the intercalated discs, they link the heart muscle cells mechanically, chemically, and electrically. So the heart actually functions like it is one single fused mass of cells. Some other features of the heart, it exhibits automaticity. This means it can contract without any outside neurostimulation. The timing of these contractions is controlled by a pacemaker cell. The, car, the heart can undergo variable contraction tension. This is controlled through the nervous system. 
The nervous system can alter the pace of the pacemaker cells and vary the force of contraction. Cardiac muscle tissue has extended contraction times. A contraction in the heart muscle lasts up to 10 times that of a skeletal muscle. And the good thing is, they do not fatigue. And the heart is prevented from summing or summation because they have very long refractory periods. This is the time between the start of an action potential and when it goes back to a normal resting uh, phase. During this period, it is impossible to re-stimulate the heart. So as a result, the heart can never go into tetanus. Downside, the heart is still a muscle and it is capable of hypertrophy and atrophy. This happens as a result of atherosclerosis, stenosis, or calcification of the valves. This is not, your heart muscle hypertrophy getting thicker is not a good thing, like it might be for our skeletal muscles. This just means the heart has to work harder and it is more strain and stress on the heart when it gets this large. Lastly, smooth muscles. These form around other tissues. They do not have tendons and they do not have aponeuroses. They are found in the blood vessels and help to regulate blood pressure and blood flow. They are found in the reproductive and glandular systems. Uh, for example, they help to produce movements that aid uh, the, the, the movement of our gametes. They are found in the digestive and urinary system, forming sphincters uh, and producing contractions uh, to control these systems. And they are found in the integumentary system. These are the erector pili muscle that we talked about earlier that cause goosebumps. When we look at smooth muscle tissue, we note this is the only non-striated muscle tissue. There is a different internal organization of the actin and myosin. They still have actin and myosin, but it's arranged differently, so we don't see these striations. There are no T-tubules, and the calcium is not stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Each individual cell is long and slender and spindle-shaped. They have a single central nucleus. There are no myofibrils and no sarcomeres. They will have scattered myosin fibers throughout the cell. These myosin fibers have more heads per thick filament compared to our skeletal muscles. And the actin filaments will be attached to dense bodies. These dense bodies are also the site of binding between adjacent smooth muscle cells. Now, how do they contract? They do go through an excitation contraction coupling mechanism, but very different from what we saw in the skeletal muscles. Remember, calcium here is not in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, but we still need free calcium in the cytoplasm to trigger a contraction. This calcium is coming from outside the cell, extracellular calcium. When a smooth muscle cell is stimulated, calcium will rush into the cell. Calcium, once it gets into the cytoplasm, will bind to calmodulin in the sarcoplasm. This will activate an enzyme called myosin light chain kinase. This enzyme will break down ATP and initiate the contraction in the smooth muscle cell. How do we control the contractions? There are two arrangements of smooth muscle cells. One is a multi-unit and the other is a visceral smooth muscle. Multi-unit smooth muscle cells are controlled by motor neurons. Visceral smooth muscle cells undergo rhythmic cycles of activity that are controlled by pacemaker cells. Let's look at these two. Here's a multi-unit smooth muscle. Notice they are individual cells. There are no or very few gap junctions. They are separate fibers and each one can contract independently. And they are arranged in motor units. They will only contract when they are stimulated by a motor nerve. You find this type of an arrangement in the walls of our large blood vessels, in the walls of the uterus, and in the iris of the eye. 
Visceral smooth muscle cells are connected to each other via gap junctions. They will undergo what is known as syncytial contraction. In other words, even though it is made up of a sheet of many cells, they act as if they are a single cell. So they create or form these sheets of spindle-shaped cells. Visceral smooth muscles undergo rhythmic wave-like contraction. They don't need a nerve to contract, but they are influenced by nerves, by hormones, by chemicals, and by stretching. They are found in many of our blood vessels, in the walls of our digestive tract, respiratory tract, and urinary tract. And this last slide here is just a nice side-by-side -side comparison of the three different types of muscle tissue.